Revolutionary Road Radio Show. I don't know why uh, people do that okay. on the radio. Is there something about extending your voice for a uh, extended well, period of time? It seems to be working for you, honey. Just keep going. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're coming to you live at beautiful downtown Clearwater and the studios of WTAN 10 Talk 1340 AM. I am your host, uh... The Rev, also known as Bruce, with my lovely co-host, uh, I'm biased, but anyway, my lovely co-host, my wife, Barb, and of course, Pete is at the helm, and we're also expecting Connie to call in, Connie Burton, who is one of our regular co-hosts, and also uh, Crown, whose uh, song that we play at every show uh, called uh, Revolution, because this show is about revolutionary talk, it's about revolutionary radio it is about bringing out issues that no one else discusses and so we come to you live every monday night uh, on the tan talk network which is in the tampa bay area we come to you through our podcast our live stream and our tune in app on your phone as well as the 1340 a.m station itself and the other station affiliates in the tampa bay area we also have a youtube channel that you can go and check out Revolutionary Road Radio Show. And we have a Facebook, and we ask that you would like us. Please like us. <laughs> anyway. We're so needy. We're so needy. Uh, and we also encourage you to check out our website, and that's where you're going to get all this information about the show by going to tantalk1340.com. That's wwwtantalk 1340 Dot com. We also want to take this time out to thank our primary sponsor, and that is St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture. Hello, Greg and crew. Uh, bringing to you the finest in alternative medicines at a sliding scale so that anyone can afford it. St. Petersburg Acupuncture uses a treatment that's an age-old treatment uh, came, coming from the Far East, that has been very successful in helping with everything from anxiety to uh, drug addiction to other kinds of health issues. And uh, we want you to support them. They're located at Central Avenue uh, in St. Petersburg, uh, located at 2450, that's 2450, or I'm sorry, 1650, excuse me, 1650 Central Avenue, that's 1650 Central Avenue, in St. Petersburg, you can reach them at 727-823-1700. That's 727-823-1700. And this show is, of course, produced by Squatter Productions, Refuge Ministries, the Refuge Worker Center, the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, and a whole host of others that endorse and support what we're doing. Tonight is going to be a very special, special show and we're very pleased and honored to have some guests with us tonight. Many may or may not be aware that this is the this that is this year the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party. It was founded in 1966 in the fall of 1966 and we hope to sometime in the next several weeks have one of the co-founders uh, Bobby Seal. Uh, of course many be, may be aware that Huey P. Newton, the co-founder, is deceased, was murdered uh, by the system. Uh, tonight, though, we have some special guests that I'll get to in a moment. But, you know, I was reflecting on this whole Black Panther issue because it is so current in the news. Of course, everyone remembers the alleged, I never thought it was really all that controversial, but apparently it was to Mayor, former Mayor Giuliani, and, I don't know, Trump and all the Republicans freaked out over Beyonce at the halftime show uh, during the Super Bowl giving a special tribute to the Panther Party. And in addition to uh, the pundits freaking out over that, uh, there's been some uh, things going on in the news with David Duke and the Klan. Apparently there was a clash in Anaheim, California uh, with some Klan supporters coming out to a Black Lives Matters event where some... Uh, 
members that uh, either are part of the former Panther Party, which I do not think they were. I think that they might have been part of the new Black Panther Party, which is totally different and really unaffiliated with the Black Panther Party. But just the name is in the news. And tonight we have some special guests that uh, have made news on the issue of the Black Panther Party and also the Angola Three. Many may remember that uh, one of uh, three African-American men were incarcerated uh, as members of the Black Panther Party in the infamous Angola prison outside of New Orleans in Louisiana. Just last week, uh, the remaining member that who was still incarcerated was released, and that was Albert Woodfo- Woodfox, who had spent 43 years in solitary confinement, unheard of in the history of the prison system. In fact, it has never happened uh, before. And uh, tonight... We have some amazing guests with us, a dear friend of mine who I've known ever since our relief trip to Hurricane Katrina some 11 years ago, uh, Malik Rahim, who is a former member of the Black Panther Party and an activist in New Orleans, and we are pleased to have him on, as well as Robert King, who is also a former Black Panther and was one of the Angola Three. And... uh, I'm real privileged, we're real privileged and honored to have these very important figures historically at this rather, uh, I guess you could say, stars aligning kind of situation going on in the United States. As a matter of fact, tonight in our own city of St. Petersburg, I was unable to attend this, but uh, the co-founder of the Black Lives Matters movement spoke at Eckerd College. Uh But these two gentlemen that I have introduced are no stranger to both controversy and speaking out and speaking truth to power. And uh, they've both paid dearly uh, with all kinds of repercussions for standing with the Black Panther Party and being part of it, and especially uh, Robert King. Uh, And uh, their third member, which I will let uh, Robert and Malik talk about more, who passed away. And then, of course, uh, Albert Woodfox, who just got out last week and has been interviewed at a number of places. Uh, I do remember when Mr. King got out, he was also interviewed at length. And uh, Malik, of course, has been on our show before. And I'm just real privileged and honored. I, My engineer tells me that you're both on the line. I don't know if Connie's called in yet. Uh, not yet, but I expect her to call in. But, uh, Brother Malik, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine, Bruce. And it's an honor uh, once again to be on your show. And, of course, I know you have been involved in this uh, movement to free the Angola Three and have very personal connections. And, of course, I know you and uh, Robert King know each other. And, uh, uh, Robert, I'm very pleased to have you on as well. Yes, good to be here, Bruce. Thank Uh, you. Thank you both for being on. Um, I consider this uh, something that is historic. And as we finish out the last day of so-called Black History Month, and I say that because it's a shame that we have to categorize histories in order for it to be paid attention to. And that is things such as Black History Month, Latino History Month, Women's History Month, which in, is indicative of the fact that white supremacy and white privilege still reigns because you have to create months for recognition. And you have to have things like a performance by Beyonce that was intended really to be a uh, tribute to the Panthers to bring attention not only to the current events that we struggle with around uh, the numerous acts of police brutality that have killed numerous African young men and women, as well as children. Let's not forget people like Tamir Rice. Um, But this is nothing new. And, of course, if you know anything about the Black Panther Party, as well as our guests uh, and the Angola Three, you'll know that this is nothing new. So I I guess by way of introduction, uh, and this is for either you, Malik, or Robert, um, please uh, tell us a little bit about your involvement in the Black Panther Party and whoever wants to go first. Well, uh, King, you want to go first? No, Malik, go ahead. I'll follow you. Uh, you were in the first 
Mickey Mouse, brother. <laughs> Your privilege. My involvement in the party started in, uh, really in 1968. Mm. Uh, that's when I was first introduced to the Black Panther Party. I was a Vietnam veteran, and uh, I was I was just uh, mesmerized by uh, young Black African American men that said that that they have had enough. Uh, it was right after Dr. King was killed. Uh, and we came to the realization that that, that nonviolence uh, wasn't going to work. That we have to uh, not say be violent, but we have to be uh, on the defensive. We have to be able to defend ourselves. Uh, being blessed coming from uh, Louisiana, I knew the history of the deacons for self-defense. So when uh, the Black Panther Party for self-defense started. You know, it just I just spiritually uh, gravitated to it, and it was one of the best things that ever happened to me, because uh, when you talk about Beyonce and how the law enforcement uh, industry in this country have came out against her, because she uh, uh, did somewhat of a demonstration uh, showing support for our history. I, I couldn't really say because I never saw it. But as a person who lived on the Gulf Coast, I can clearly say that, uh, and as being a co-founder of an organization that served over half a million people in the aftermath of Katrina, that it wouldn't have been a common ground if it wouldn't have been a A3 support committee. And it wouldn't have been an A3 support committee if it wouldn't have been the Black Panther Party. So what I'm really saying, it was the teachings of the Black Panther Party, the principles, the guiding principles of the Black Panther Party that played a critical role in the recovery of the Gulf Coast. And and they've never received any recognition for it. You know, it's sad that, but you know, I, I'm a very spiritual person, and I you know that this is happening on our 50th anniversary. That just by uh, chance, by Beyonce uh, performed at the uh, halftime uh, show, and that she gave. Uh, a tribute to uh, the party, if that's what she was doing. Uh, and the same thing about with the documentary uh, Black Panther, you know, coming out right now. Vanguard of the Revolution coming out right now. And most uh, and above all is that album was released. You know, I mean, and it is sad that we are talking about uh in the aftermath of, what, of the greatest disaster to hit America, that two individuals from a solid from solitary confinement fell, helped in the recovery of the Gulf Coast, and never received any recognition for it. You see, uh, uh, Herman, you know, was uh, you know, was bled for the rest of his life. You know, they bled him out of, out of the remaining years of his life. You know, only to let him out a couple of days before his died. That was his reward for helping save the Gulf Coast. And that, by the way, was the uh, third member of the Angola Three who unfortunately has passed on. Oh, yes, and Albert. I mean, uh, look what he had to endure. Never being better. <coughs> You know, and we have a state that is, that is bankrupt. But we was able to come up with almost $10 million to spend on keeping these two men confined just since Katrina. Hmm. Not saying that we're going to help them or, or that we're going to honor what they did, but just to keep them confined. But I guess when you look at what kind of state we live in, that I live in, 
You know, uh, it said that America lead the world in uh, incarceration. Louisiana leads the, uh, the United States in incarceration. In New Orleans, feed Louisiana. So only in a in a in a, a state that is governed by like this, that no one can uh, that this could exist. Because in the ten years since Katrina. The Black Panther Party, uh, the Angola Three, all common ground, have never received any recognition for the work they have done. You know, as you're saying this, I'm I'm struck by the fact, and of course, from a personal level, uh, that's how you and I connected. Malik was uh, the aftermath of Katrina, as myself and uh, Mike or Joe. Who I know you remember, uh, we drove a rider truck there and with our own magnetic sign on the sign of the truck and managed to get into the heart of New Orleans and to the uh, French Algiers and, and Ninth Ward as well uh, and connect with you and the relief effort there. And I, I'm struck by the fact that so many things that have been done at a grassroots level to affect change, to speak up for people, are not recognized, particularly because we have this very limited understanding of history, particularly the history of things like the Black Panther Party. And you have complete and total ignoramuses, and that's the word I'm gonna use, like Donald Trump and Mayor, former Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, who make these just totally racist, dumb statements and fail to recognize the sheer brutality of the prison industrial complex as well as the uh, law enforcement industrial complex, as you said, Malik. Um, and I'm struck by that. And I, I, I know for you, this it has been a, a long, hard struggle. I know for Robert, it has been the same. I'm pleased to begin to get to know you, Robert. And I'm wondering what your thoughts were. How important was the Black Panther Party? both in the struggle that led to your incarceration, your, unju your unjust incarceration, I might add, and how important was that? And tell us about what is the Angola 3 or what was the Angola 3? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Bruce. And again, it's good to be here. But my uh, connection with the Black Panther Party is... Unlike Malik, Malik uh, we were born in New Orleans, I mean, in New Orleans, in the South, in the same place. Uh, lived in Algiers most of our, our lives, or most of my life, uh, from my young life. Uh, that was, you know, Malik, Malik went to the Army. And uh, I ended up going to, and coming out of the Army, uh, he joined the Black Panther Party after leaving the Army and having his experience. And, uh, I guess I went to prison, and I... After coming out, I joined the party. By, this, by the time I had came in contact with the Black Panther Party, I had already been introduced uh, you know, into the system and, and in prison. And I was, I guess I was kind of, I was kind of right. And I, I must admit, so many people had said a lot of things, had defined the system, had put it in context. Uh, at the time, I could not understand it uh, at all. I could not understand the context of the system. I just thought things were naturally, you know, the way they were. And it wasn't until the Black Panther Party came on the set after going to prison and getting out and and being arrested, rearrested and, and and sent back to prison on a parole violation because I had the audacity to be with someone who I had been to prison and it was a um violate you know, a violation of a parole to be with someone who had uh, been to prison and it was ironic because just about everybody in my neighborhood had came in contact with the system. So, uh, having this, having this, you know, uh, this record so called record not associate uh, with any known uh, uh, quote criminal unquote, and and that was again I was violated because of uh, my association with someone who had been been to prison, and it was at this time group that I began to look at the system to question the system. Uh, as to what it was, uh, I began to see the discrepancy. Uh, uh, I think my involvement uh, uh, started then, but it wasn't until 
I came in contact with the teachers of the Black Panther Party. Of course, Malcolm X had stated I learned later on, Elijah Muhammad, and then I learned about all of the writers of the Renaissance writers, you know, uh, Richard Wright, W. E. Du Bois, and just slam them on to infinity. I, I remember coming in contact with those after I came in contact with the Black Panther Party. But it was the Black Panther Party who led me on the trek uh, because when I began to, after being uh, arrested and given a a charge of uh, after you know having gone to prison and because I had a record, uh, they wanted me to plead guilty to a charge and I wouldn't. They wanted to give me a, a 15 years and I refused to do so and I elected to go to trial and they gave me a 35 year sentence. And it was at this time that I began to look at the system exactly for what it was and I began to equate the system with with slavery and uh, I saw myself as being, you know, uh, being treated, and I, then I put it on a broader scale. I saw that happen to you know, a whole nation of people, a whole race of people, namely, you know, African American in this country. And it was at um, when the Black Panther Party said, "We want freedom, power to determine our destiny." That spoke directly to my to my heart. It articulated things that I couldn't articulate at the time when it said, "We want." Uh, a, a, a lane, closed house, and education, justice, and peace, you know, and as our major political objective of the United Nations supervised subject site, you know, that would be held, in, and, you know, in a black community in which black owner your subject would be allowed to participate, you know, for the point of determining our will, and that I had never heard things put this way before. Uh, I had never uh, 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 interpreted them, you know, uh, uh, conceived them or perceived them in, in that light. And so, yeah, I, I, it was an honor for me to come in contact, and I was in prison at the time. Uh, I must admit that after feeling that I had, you know, be, uh, been a, you know, uh, being treated like a slave, I did the only uh, thing that a slave could do was rebel because I had no legal right to rebel because, uh, uh, you know, a slave had, had no had no legal rights. The only legal right they had was a legal right to be a, a slave, but they had a moral right to rebel, and I exercised the moral right to rebel, and I escaped out to New Orleans. Uh, Paris prison and it and, and and at that time uh things seemed to have been coming together because uh, uh the black Panther Party at the time had come to New Orleans and I had no idea that they were in the city but at the same time I was arrested they were there and I came in contact with members of the Black Panther Party and uh, and it was at that time that uh, I decided to uh, to join the, the Black Panther Party and subsequently join the struggle because the struggle goes on. And in struggling in, in, in my struggle along with, you know, after having been arrested, gone to prison, uh, coming out uh, who had, you know, came about up the same way, my two comrades who, uh, the other two uh, um, fellas of Angola, the um, they, uh, they came into contact the same way I did, and they became members of the Black Panther Party. And they went to Angola, and they decided to implement changes because both had had previous prison records, and they were placed in isolation. They were, uh, you know, stored. They were given trumped up charges, and there was no evidence uh, uh, tied either one of them. None of the Angola, the initial Angola folks to the crime, but nevertheless, uh, people were tied to it, and people were convicted. I came into contact because I was a member of the Black Panther Party. Though I wasn't in prison at the time that this, you know, this uh, incident occurred, I was... Two weeks away, and two weeks after going to prison, they placed me in solitary confinement along with uh, Herman and Albert. And uh, subsequently, uh, I was kept in solitary confinement. Of course, there was some other things that went on, but I was kept in solitary confinement for 29 of the 31 years that I was in prison. And it was doing that, he became known as, uh, uh, along with Herman and Albert, as Angola Three. Yeah, and. It still stands. It's uh, and of course Albert uh, being the longest, but all total uh, the longest uh, group of people to be put in solitary confinement in U.S. history. Um, and we know that there are other political prisoners. Of course, many are familiar with Mumbia Abu Jamal or uh, certainly Leonard Peltier with the American Indian Movement who is a similar movement of uh, uh, indigenous rights group uh, who stood up and stood up to the system in the same kind of manner that the Black Panther Party did as well as 
uh, the Young Lords and a whole host of others. Um, you know, what was it like? Uh, and this is for either one of you, Malik or Robert. Um, what was it like to be part of a group that uh, <laughs> essentially was on the number one list for uh, uh, the FBI and the government as a subversive organization? In fact, uh, uh, many who know the history of the Panthers as well as groups like the American Indian Movement know about COINTELPRO and what COINTELPRO did uh, and what they were. It was an arm of the government that sought to destabilize any uh, group that was about self-determination and standing up for uh, the rights of the oppressed. What was it like to be part of a, a party that, you know, even today is still, as we discussed uh, earlier, still derated uh, by people like uh, Rudolph Giuliani and, and the police and, you know, the pundits that are running in the Republican Party seem to be uh, taking pot shots at the oppressed. What what was it like? And tell me, are you still feeling that same kind of pressure? Well, that's for what it was like. It was the greatest experience and the most joyous experience I ever had in my life. Mm. Uh, you know, in my experience in the Black Panther Party, it, it's just the foundation for the rest of my life. Nothing that I've ever done since then, I could not be, fall back on the party and uh, and the party teaching and the party teaching me how to become an organizer. Uh, it's it, that has been the you know I mean that has been the focus of my life. You know my you know when I joined the party, I didn't join the party uh, for a year. I didn't join the party for two years. I joined a movement, and that movement is for the upliftment of my people. And that's when I'm in till the day I die. You know, so uh, the, but the party is, is, you know, the teachers of the party. To be around individuals that believe, that have like understanding, the individuals that have made the same commitment, seeing individuals be, uh, not only uh, incarcerated, but many killed for standing up for this belief. You know, I mean, when, when we started the party in 1970, you know, I mean, uh, Fred Hampton had just got killed in December of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of 69. You know, so, it, you know, it was a, a, a reality that, you know, that all of us know of what was happening. It was shootouts all over the country. You think there was a... Uh, uh, many mass incarceration, but we came together because we came with a love for our people and our love that that is up to us to uh, uplift our people. And nobody else can do it but us. No one else can lead it but us. And the party stood on those principles. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Bruce, I cannot tell you. Uh, the joy it is every time I'm around my comrades. You know, I mean, the, when I'm in New York, the sit with, with comrades. You know, uh, when I'm in California. You know, when I'm in Seattle. You know, when I'm in Washington. You know, Chicago. You know, uh, Philadelphia. You know, I mean, it feels good when you can go into a city and have individuals that, that will take you in and embrace you in, in pure love and brotherhood simply because of the fact that y'all had that common bond of being members of the Black Panther Party. Oh, yes, this, this, uh, it was the greatest experience I had in my life, you know. And, uh, and you know, and one thing I've always, you know, I've always, uh, you know, I've always based everything upon this teaching. Because I truly believe that two of the greatest uh, black men of my generation was here P. Newton and Bobby Seale. Wow, that's quite a tribute, and you know, I'm I'm pretty, um, I guess, overwhelmed by the significance as I've gotten to know some of the former Black Panther people, including you, Malik. Uh, 
by how important this organization was and is in the history of struggle against oppression by the system, particularly oppression of the African American community and other oppressed communities. And so, uh, I, I can only say that's, that's amazing. Uh, the perspective you have. And I also, uh, of course want to hear what, uh, what Robert has to say as well. We're going to just take a brief break and we're spending the hour tonight because we believe this is important at the revolutionary road radio show to spend the hour talking about something that's we're in the midst of right now. It's a historical epoch that's happening right now and a kind of re uh, visiting again of what Michelle Alexander has called the new Jim Crow that's happening. And we'll talk with our guests about that. Uh, you're listening to the revolutionary road radio show. And I'm your host, uh, the rev Bruce with, uh, my lovely wife, Barbara and, uh, at our engineering helm there, Mr. Pete. And of course, Connie Burton, who we hope will be on soon as well as crown who are part of our show. And we are very pleased to have with us Malik Rahim uh, of the Black Panther Party and Robert King of the Black Panther Party and also uh, one of the surviving members of the Angola Three. And we're going to talk a bit about Angola and the brutal prison system, one of the last vestiges of uh, slavery that continues to this day. Uh, but we want to let you know a little bit about us. The Revolutionary Road Radio Show, of course, comes to you every Monday night. This show is uh, underwritten in part by St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture, off offering sliding scale appointments in alternative medicines. They are located at 1624 Central Avenue in St. Petersburg. Call 727-823-1700. That's 727-823-1700. If you want to uh, take advantage of this wonderful uh, community local business that supports revolutionary causes, by the way, not just our show, but... Uh, revolutionary medicine which is something that they consider part of their inspiration was the black panther party and its commitment to health to uh, breakfast programs to health clinics these are things that people don't know about and, and alternative medicines that not, not a lot of people know about that the black panther party was involved in uh, yeah. this show is produced by squatter productions the refuge poor people's economic human rights campaign the refuge worker center and we also thank the following organizations for endorsing us students for a democratic society at university of south florida st pete sds as they're called is a historic organization as well food not bombs st pete which is part of food not bombs uh we uh international which is also a historic organization that began in the uh, 60s late uh, early 70s and uh their founder keith McHenry, will be coming to the area to speak uh, we also want to thank St. Pete for Peace, the Revolutionary Caucus, the League of Revolutionaries for New America, Gulf Coast Greens, Pinellas Greens, and Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And uh, if you want to sponsor or advertise, you can call us at 727-278-1547. Uh, we are looking for sponsors and advertisers to support and endorse this show. This show can be heard and seen on live stream as we are live right now on the internet. You can also check out our, our podcast by subscribing and uh, to our website uh, and get the show via download uh, app on your phone, the TuneIn app. You can go to tantalk1340.com. That's tan, T-A-N, talk, T-A-L-K, 1340.com. We also have a YouTube channel by the same name, name, and you can like us all on Facebook as well. Want to let you know about a couple of things coming to the area. March second, that's in a couple of days at St. Pete for Peace. They continue their film series. Uh, this uh, film, uh, latest documentary film, is called Turkey and Saudi Arabia: Two Causes of the War in Syria. As many know, that conflict continues and is spilling over into Libya. And uh, this show or this film is a very important film at Community Cafe Wednesday at 7 p.m. And you can check uh, them out at Community Cafe 2450 Central Avenue. Also, this uh, Thursday 
is the Fight for 15 community meeting in St. Petersburg at Childs Park Neighborhood Association, Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. The Fight for 15, of course, is a national movement of low-wage workers, predominantly people of color, fighting for the right to have a living wage. And uh, we also want to let you know that there is a whole host of other things coming to the area if you want to know more about uh, what we're doing, including uh, a... uh, March that will be happening with the Coalition of Immokalee Farm Workers. We'll be talking about that in the coming weeks on March 12th. And also some demonstrations happening at both the Republican and Democratic uh, debates happening in Miami in a couple weeks. And uh, also at the conventions themselves. Well, we have had the honor and privilege of having on the Revolutionary Road radio show Malik Rahim and Robert King, both... uh, former members of the Black Panther Party uh, and supporters of the Angola Three, Robert King being one of the Angola Three, along with Herman Wallace and uh, Albert Woodfox, who was just recently released. Herman Wallace, of course, uh, unfortunately, after only a few days of freedom, passed away. Such an honor and, and such an education. I mean, it's just uh, not only the honor of of being able to hear these things straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. But, you know, just the, the, I could sit here and listen to his experiences for hours. It's just so profound and so um, deep. And in what these, these people have endured and this, these three men have endured and had to survive, but to come out of it without the bitterness, you know, that's amazing. It's incredible to me. And, you know, Knowing and the things that they did, the breakfast projects and all these things that they did when they were involved with the Panthers that, you, like you said, a lot of people didn't know about. But um, just to hear the stories and to hear what they've been through and to hear what their message is as a result of b- having been through all that is just incredible. And I'm so honored to have you here. Yeah, we are both honored to have you on, as I know our listeners are, and and uh, Connie and uh, Crown and all the team here at the Revolutionary Road Radio Show. Uh, Robert, tell us a little bit about why was, especially when you were incarcerated, why was not only the support you received as a member of the Angola Three important, but the Black Panther Party? Why was it so important to you? Well, uh, the Black Panther Party was, you know, its philosophy, it was really important to me because I I had adopted it. Uh, the philosophy of Black Panther Party, and uh, uh, this was, you know, uh, something that uh, 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 allowed me to see, uh, after adopting this philosophy, to see things in a much clearer light and to understand why things uh, were like they, like they was. So uh, I adopted this uh, philosophy, and I, I gladly adopted this, this philosophy because what it did was it allowed me, it kept me afloat, you know, uh, uh, in, a, in a situation, especially in prison, you know, uh, with the, the type of sentence that I had, you know, with no way of ever uh, being uh, uh, getting out according to, you know, the legal uh, status, uh, definition of what I had. But uh, in my heart and in my mind, I was, I was totally, I was free. I, and I you know, I, I never felt that I was totally disbanded or anything like that or that I would be abandoned uh, uh, because... I think the Black Panther Party provided me with uh, a profound consciousness, and and this uh, uh, this consciousness allowed me allowed me, as I said, to stay afloat and to uh, the weather the you know the storm that was inside of Angola, and at that time it was a terrible storm. It was considered you know the worst prison in, in, in the nation, and the psychological damage was just as much as physical damage, uh, though because you know where we were kept in solitary. Um, and uh, six by nine by twelve, and for the first seven years, we saw no sunlight at all. Uh, we weren't even allowed out of uh, our uh, out on the yard. We uh, got an hour in the hall, and the other twenty three hours we were in. So it was a, it was as a result, however, you know, because of the teaching of Black Panther Party, because of the strength that was exhibited by uh, you know you know an organization of you know men, women. Um, you know, in which I was really proud, you know, and I wanted to uh, attain something. Uh, you know, when I was in prison, you know, I had a case. I was just being held in Paris prison, and I first came into contact 
Jack, which team members of the Black Panther Party in September 1970 in the first uh, shootout. I call it shoot in sometimes because most times they don't shoot in. But, uh, you know, I, I witnessed this. I was in a cell being held on the fifth floor uh, waiting, to, uh, waiting to go to Angola, and um, uh, there was a television on, on, on the flat on the fifth floor where we were, and we had mixed wild. We couldn't see, but we could hear it. It was really for the officer, but uh, there was an uh, intervention, uh, I mean, an intervention into the, uh, uh, the program and that were on, and it pointed out that there were a group of militants who were shooting it out in the night uh, 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 with the police, and that caught my attention. And then it, later on, it went on to point out that there were, you know, uh, members of the Black Panther Party, of course, with NCCL, you know, National Committee to Combat Fascism. But I must admit, Bruce, I see all that to say is that while while listening to this, uh, and and my consciousness constantly evolving because I had a state because I didn't want to be a slave, and I I witnessed this, and I mean I was so proud of getting that I wish that I, I, could, I wish I could have transported myself into that house at the time. I would have been inside that house with those brothers, even without a weapon, just to, to be around them, those brothers and sisters who were in that house. And uh, this is how impacted the Black Panther was on my life, because they see things again that I could not articulate. I, I you know, I, I felt that they were for the people. They were the, the, the boys for the people and the vanguard for the people. That's the way I accepted it. You know, vanguard movements throughout the history of uh, people's movements uh, rising up against oppression have been very important because they've been at the forefront of struggle. And I know both of you have, as well as your colleagues, and both uh, in New Orleans and with the Angola Three, but also around the country. Um, and, I, I mean, there, there's just so much to ask here. I mean... I, I really think, and I know they've done documentaries before about the Panthers. There's a new one out on PBS. And I know they've done some documentaries about the Angola Three. But it just seems like the, the subject is exhaustive. I mean, I mean, there's so much to talk about. Let's talk a minute about Angola. You know, this is also somewhat personal. I, I have a young man that myself and a dear friend of mine, Dennis, Siegel with the Coalition for the Reform of Youth Services is working with now that's in Angola and is facing, uh, last time I checked, I think it's 20 years um, and it's trumped up um, and, uh, you know, we of course had grave concerns when we heard he was going to Angola and I do realize there's different wards on the prison but its reputation, of course, precedes itself as you have pointed out all too well both of you, uh, what was it like, Robert, to be in a small, I mean, it's smaller than our little studio that we're in right now, it's about half the size, nearly 24 hours a day, what, how did you, you mentioned that it was because of the support of, of the Panthers and others that you were able to make it through this, but what was it like, how, how did it feel? Smothering, but uh, exhausting. But you know, uh, it's almost as if you know I had maybe kind of accepted the fact of you know mind over matter. Uh, and I, I say that because I had a I had developed you know and and you know ideology. You know, I was in prison and I bowed because of my political consciousness. I said, you know what? I said, I'm in prison. And I said, but prison would never get in me. And I, I made mm -hmm. that vow. And I think I was I could only keep that vow to not let prison uh, get in me uh, because of my conviction and because of the philosophy that I had uh, embraced myself with, which was the Black Panther Party, uh, Party's philosophy of struggle. And uh, I think it was uh, that mindset that, uh, that, that, you know, that I was in prison, but I would not allow prison to, to get in me. Uh, I think that was the thing that kind of uh, gave me the body, you know, that I needed. You know, over the years, I've had people asking, you know, uh, uh, 
Why aren't you crazy? <laughs> you know they, <laughs> I, I, you know they go around acting. You know they act in a you know, soul way, and I, I kind of laugh and I kind of you know look at them, Bruce, and I kind of. I let them know straight up. I said, wait a minute. I did not tell you I wasn't crazy. You know, <laughs> hey, that's, I, not, in other words, my point is this: that you don't get dipped in ways to knock some up smell. Yeah. I don't. I, I don't tell them I'm psychotic or I'm insane or not, but I'm. I'm crazy enough to want to do something and angry enough to want to do something about the situation that, that had engulfed me and shouted me for so long and, you know, and had tried its best to dehumanize me and the impact of it I so high it dehumanized so many other people. You know, these are the things that kept me afloat because I wanted to rid this, undermine this, this in any way I could. And I, I couldn't do much from a prison cell, but... Uh, my thoughts, my rumination, and the action that we took uh, kind of impacted a little of the stuff that was going on in Angola. Wow. What are your thoughts, Malik, as you're hearing your good friend here, Robert, speak? And, of course, you've been involved with this all along. And I do want to get to in a minute uh, what uh, how Albert's doing. Uh, and I know he's been inundated with the interviews, especially, unfortunately, the the record he has of having been in solitary for 43 years uh i mean i can't imagine what 29 years was like which you were sharing um but before we get to maybe just letting us know what's going on with albert uh malik what are your thoughts when you hear this uh and you know you guys lived this uh this struggle uh what are your thoughts To see, uh, it, it shows uh, human endurance, you know, uh, you know, for for all these years, for forty five years, the state of Louisiana had uh, had a, a unwritten policy to crush what they call black pantherism, you know, and and that black pantherism that they was trying to crush was a racist organization that was bent on uh, killing all white people. No, I mean, and they uh, projected this all the way till the end. In fact, they still are, as you probably heard, comparing, uh, not to interrupt, but they've compared the Panthers recently to the Klan, which is unbelievable. Uh, Well, well, that's because of the... Uh, the myth, the myth that they have uh, established, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, uh, they have yeah. cried wolf so long about this, you know, about us. And, you know, we are, we are a nation that uh, that before we go out and to destroy anything, we take it through a process of demonization, you know. Mm-hmm. So the Panther Party was so demonized that people didn't look at it. Uh, the fact of all the good it was doing. Yes, we was about self-defense, but it's never been where any party member have been convicted for just uh, open aggression. You know, I mean, uh, look at... Unlike the Klan. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, we work with all organizations. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Fred Hampton used to say that... uh, uh, you don't fight uh, fire with fire. You fight fire with water. You dig and you fight racism, not with racism, but you fight racism with solidarity. You yeah, know? Absolutely. And again, you know, I mean, these are these were the principles of the party. You know, the party never uh, stood for uh, any form of racism. You know, I mean, we stood against oppression. Right. And that's, mm-hmm. that was the greatest part about it. Because it, it gave me, it, it allowed me to learn the distinction, you know. I mean, and, and, and the last thing they want to see is that uh, in the aftermath, and I'm going back to the aftermath of Katrina, that over 19,000 whites came down mm-hmm. and worked under the organization that was formed by uh, the Black Panther Party, by members of the Black Panther Party, because most people who was geared to my house they was geared to my house, and how they know who to go to is because they know that, that they was going to visit a panther. 
You dig it? And the, and the same thing about with Herman. I mean, Herman and Albert. You know what I mean, I can't, you know, I mean, in the history of this nation, when have individuals that was locked up like they was, you know, made that type of sacrifice? You dig that helped save a, a, a region of this nation, you know, and, and, have, and they haven't received any recognition for it. You know, simply because of the fact that it was the Black Panther Party. Right. And, they, and, and, and you know, I mean, uh, they had 43 years. You know, they convinced Burton Miller, the guard who they was accused of killing, they had 43 years just to convince his wife. Hmm. And they couldn't do that in 43 years. Yeah. They couldn't convince our congressman. They couldn't uh, convince our city councilman. Of their guilt, but I will state just based upon those lies and the and the blatant racism have held these men you know, for this long just to be an example that if you try to do anything, this is what we are do to you. You know that's a scathing indictment on uh, uh, racism. White, white privilege, privilege and white pro- power. You know, um, our own church where we go to, uh, uh, we had her on last week, our, our pastor, who is an uh, open, openly lesbian minister. Uh, and our church was attacked because we chose to use our sign out front. To, instead of saying silly, stupid things like a lot of churches do, we spoke about white privilege and the importance of addressing white privilege. And boy, the firestorm we faced. And that's nothing I know compared to 500 years of oppression and slavery uh, and uh, genocide. And, uh, well, and, and I, the, the point was using our white privilege for social justice. Right. You know, and not denying that we even have white privilege. Absolutely. And that was the, the message that we wanted to get out to the community. And, and I think that's where it starts. There's so many uh, Caucasians who don't even understand that they have this white privilege. They, they, some of them are, get so irate and rageful mm. over even insinuating that we might have white privilege when it's such an ingrained privilege that they can't even see it. They can't see the forest for the trees. Absolutely. And, and I, I know, in having worked with you, Malik, and uh, knowing about you, Robert King, uh, and just knowing the history of the Panthers, that the... Uh, derogatory, hateful, over-the-top, ridiculous statements made by people like Giuliani and Trump and David Duke and the Klan and the the pundits at Fox 13 at all uh, has been nothing short of ridiculous. Um, But I think that has brought to light the struggle that the Black Lives Matters movement is in the thick of now and that it is not new, Mm -hmm. that the system has had it rigged and speaking of rigged, I was wondering if you guys could com- comment briefly. Of course, I know uh, uh, Albert could not be on the show tonight, but uh, I know you both know him well. Of course, obviously know him well. Um, Robert, how is Albert faring since he got out? Albert is uh, faring uh, uh, pretty good. He and I, as a matter of fact, earlier today we were um, in the studio. He was in his studio there and I was here in Austin in the studio and we were on CNN International. I think it's something we'll be at tomorrow sometime, I'm not sure. But he's he's adjusting uh, real well. He's surrounded by, by friends, family, supporters, and uh, he's, you know, getting his, you know, um, you know, going to see uh, doctors and working out to get good, you know, health checkups and, and he's going to move from there. But his intent is uh, one of you know he 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 uh, joined the struggle as well, and he understands uh, he um, semi committed himself to to you know to to to, uh, to you know to exhausting himself to try to uh, make some changes, and that's what he plans to do. So it's going to take a while for him to be totally uh, adjusted, uh, uh, and may not ever be adjusted to a system that is now adjusted, but. Are, are well enough adjusted to, you know, to be able to, you know, uh, to make some impact. And that's where he is. That's where his mindset is. And uh, and it will take a little time, but uh, he, uh, he uh, uh, also, you know, uh, had a chance to get, get the uh, 
I tried to thank all of his supporters worldwide. I mean, um, the people who got on on board with him. You cannot reach out to everyone, but uh, uh, you know, you need, you know, just uh, individually. But he he do send his regards, and he'll be uh, sending words out for, from now on. And you'll be hearing a lot from him. Uh, uh, Albert will make the right adjustment, and he will uh, do the things. Uh, I think uh, that that Herman Wallace would have loved to do. Uh, had he um, been released from prison and had some life left. But anyway, Albert, we want to make up for some of that. Well, I know that uh, the attention given to the Panthers and Angola 3, and not just the recent attention with the uh, Beyonce thing and the interviews with Albert as he got out, but, you know, everybody from uh, Spike Lee to Desmond Tutu to the Pope to, uh, you know, a whole host of... uh, musicians and artists have given attention to this uh that uh, unfortunately even with all the media attention uh the powers that be have never fully acknowledged the injustice of the uh, persecution of the panthers the injustice of what happened to you guys as the angola three um i want to kind of take it in the closing minutes of our show give you both an opportunity to make a quick comment but i i do want uh maybe if you would to comment briefly about the intersectionality of what you guys have been involved in for many years and the current black lives matters movement so maybe you both could give some closing thoughts about that well um go ahead Malik. no go ahead Ken. uh well yeah uh there is uh, there is a definitely a, a connection between the you know where we are now and Black Lives Matter. I mean, we have been saying it in so many words that you know, uh, uh, maybe not in, in 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 that those you know that sound Black Lives Matter, but uh, you know, in our lives, in our actions, in the things that we've been doing to, to make sure that you know, look, our lives matter too. Uh, mm-hmm. When we cry for, you know, for justice, uh, when we cry out against oppression, you know, when we cry out against discrimination, uh, because we don't see it in, in, you know, being done to other people, especially not as much as it's done to us. That is discrimination, and you know, we, we, we are, we, we, we when we protest that, we are saying that black, black lives matters, and of course, um, the Black Lives Matter movement intersects strictly and totally uh, with it because there has been a succession of struggles that's been on different levels and different generations. And so the struggle uh, is an upward spiral, and it, it goes on. And the Black Lives uh, 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 Movement, uh, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, shows this, that the struggle is a, uh, something that is continuous. It's an upward spiral, and you can't rest one moment because uh, if, you, if you do, then, you know, the struggle of... Uh, uh, become the phone. And Malik, uh, we've got maybe 30 seconds left. Uh, maybe you could give a little summation as well. Well, uh, in 30 seconds, the only thing I would like to say is this here, Bruce. I would like to thank you and uh, your wife and for the sacrifice you have made. I would like to thank Jimmy with uh, Food Not Bombs, Veterans for Peace, and the Green Party for the sacrifices that they have made and bringing awareness and keeping uh, uh, this at the conscious because we are a nation that is without a conscious. Asleep. You know, and, and we have to be that conscious. Yeah. Well, Malik, I just can't thank you enough, Malik Rahim, as well as Robert King of the Angola Three and the, both of you with the Black Panther Party for being part of our show, sharing with Barb and myself and Pete and all of our listeners, as well as Connie and Crown, and your heart. And I, I do look forward to continuing to talk to you further uh, as we get closer to the actual anniversary date. Uh, again, we hope to have Bobby Seal on sometime soon. And uh, I know we mentioned uh, that we were going to have Chuck D on. Uh, he unfortunately couldn't be on this month during Black History Month because his father passed away. But we are going to be having him on soon. Thank you guys so much for listening to Revolutionary Road Radio Show every Monday night at 10 p.m.